She's got a weird sassy pose. I didn't know this existed. This looks like dog shit. Well, I'm gonna talk about eco-terrorism. Got too excited about jorts. I'm leaving now with my Roomba or your blood on my hands. I'm back, back on my bullshit. What is meme if not air horn persevering? No, this is, this is not a family show. And I quote, many American titties. Why'd you have to bring Dane Cook to this, Andrew? No one wanted that. Oh, you guys are not ready for what I've got today. And I've apparently hit the very end of my attention span. Give me like 30 seconds, I'm looking for rhymes. Hello and welcome to Debate This, the show where no one is right, but someone is definitely wrong. In this show, we take time out of our busy adult lives to talk about comic books, video games, and how there is an inverse relationship between one's enjoyment of Michael Bay films and their distance from puberty. The closer you get to 13, the cooler Megan Fox looks in front of all those explosions. Uh, I think like The Rock is still enjoyable past puberty um is the rock in a michael bay movie no, no the, the movie he, the rock <laughs> he has a movie oh. called the rock starring yeah. nicholas cage actually and... i had the same question matt it's good <laughs> you're fine i think my enjoyment of nicholas cage movies has had the inverse effect the yeah. farther away that i get away from puberty the Definitely. more i enjoy nicholas cage movies yeah they are conflicting bell curves Mm -hmm. I would They're say opposite it. sides of the sexual spectrum. <laughs> Ar Armageddon and The Rock are two legitimately fun to watch Michael Bay movies, regardless of your your age and gender. All right, cool. I didn't know you were a Michael Bay apologist, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, he's, big he's the last. Bay fan, he's the last true auteur, Matt. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey, we're back for another flavor text, and today's was commissioned by good patron and even better friend, Thunder Chicken, in our Discord. Thunder Chicken, in our Discord. Cut that first one out, Todd. If you're new to the <laughs> Debate This podcast feed and are unfamiliar with our flavor text episodes, then you're going to learn today, as the mission of flavor text is to teach you all there is to know about one specific property. I'm really happy that you put in the notes... You won't learn today. <laughs> <laughs> good. All of the properties we've done flavor text on for the last few sessions. Nope. All of the flip. Jesus. All of the properties we've done flavor text on for the last few seasons have been commissioned by the valiant members of hashtag butt thwomp nation over at patreon.com slash debate this cast. And like I said, today's flavor text is no different. If you would like to make us learn everything about one thing, you can do that at the aforementioned patreon.com slash debate this cast. My brain is melted. The only thing in my brain is content for this flavor text. Now, <laughs> today's flavor text dunked me in a giant vat of toxic nostalgia goo and turned me into a big old mutant fanboy. We're not doing X-Men. Just to be clear, uh, we're not doing X-Men. We're not doing X-Men. Uh, it not also it could be Fallout. It's good also all <laughs> it's also Much like the MCU, or Harley we're Quinn. not doing X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, keep going. As I dust off my action figures, old backpack, wristwatch, Halloween costumes, and even the mirror in my childhood bedroom, I was reminded just how much I loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles growing up. A quintessential pillar of my young personality was my desire to be a cool martial arts ninja. And if it meant I got to wear a cool shell on my back, then so be it. I sat in my room today and reminisced about all of my older cousins' hand-me-down toys. I learned more about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles than I ever could have imagined as a kid, and I brought Andrew, Karate Creatures Henderson, <laughs> Todd, Preteen Dirty Jean Kung Fu Kangaroos Thomas, and Kyle, Adolescent Radioactive Black Belt Hamsters Harper along for the journey. Are these all um, non- non-copyright infringing uh, parodies of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that have been used over the years? So these were actually comic books written to compete with the Turtles in the mid-80s. Oh, yes, yeah. of course they were. Ooh. Yeah. Um, I think I had to read them all out loud to make a decision, but I think Preteen Dirty Jean Kung Fu Kangaroos is my favorite. Yeah. It, it rolls well, off the tongue the best. It has a nice cadence. It's got the nice, good... Good internal rhyme, yeah. And it's mm -hmm. it's funny because there was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figure of a kangaroo named Walkabout that I owned, and I actually just put a picture of it in the show notes. <laughs> I I he, owned this action surly. figure. His name's Walkabout. 
<laughs> Todd, I hate to tell you, but that's a that's a preteen dirty jean kung fu kangaroo in your parents' life. <laughs> yeah. Shut your whore mouth, Kyle Harper. <laughs> it's it a real a... mega box mega blocks Lego situation. <laughs> right. I think I like it because it has the same cadence as one eyed, one horn flying purple people yeah, eater. It does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's what it is. Yeah. Hey, anyway. Uh, before, Wait, oh, do you have quick, something else, Todd? Quick. What do you have? Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, walkabout is described as a crocodile hunter and a swag man. <laughs> and a swag man. <laughs> I have cool. nothing else to add to this moment. Well, then, before we jump in, I would like to ask the ceremonial question of what do you guys know about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles here at the start of this flavor text? Yeah, I mean, everything that a five-year-old could possibly know about a particular property. Um, <laughs> much like you, I had I had not one, not two, but a box, a, a bin, if you will, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Tur- Turtle toys. Um, one of them, you could transform Michelangelo into a pizza. You could just, like, transform it. No, he shot, <laughs> or did he shoot pizzas out of his belly? It might have been one or he both of those things. He shot pizzas out of his belly, I think. That, yep, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, cartoon... Uh, I had, we were talking before we hit record, I had the the Turtles live in concert on VHS as well as <laughs> <laughs> The Secret of the Ooze, the second movie, um, which I have fond memories of. But again, I, if somebody told me it's not very good, I would, wouldn't, I would believe you because I was three years old. Um, so yeah, a lot of fond memories of, of the Turtles. Um, I was, I, I weirdly like, I, I fall in this weird middle ground where i weirdly like know enough about the teenage mutant ninja turtles that i was ready to be like the second in command on this flavor text um but i my dear sweet catholic mother would not let me watch teenage mutant ninja turtles as a kid so i don't have a ton of like nostalgia tied up in it i just like once i could watch my own things i was like i remember those turtles looked pretty cool let's see what they were all about (laughs) and like it was around the time that they were rebooting or like trying to get some reboots off the ground. So there was like new mm. turtle stuff to consume. So like, like I said, I know a fair amount, but at the same time, like don't have any of that childhood nostalgia tied up into it. Cause I was not allowed to watch it as a kid. I um, love the idea that you got into turtles the same way that like a lot of us got into dragon ball 10 years after it aired. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's yeah. very fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> I growing up think I also had the same the like the physically the same box of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> mm-hmm. toys that Andrew had. Um, it's a I weird quantum remember. box. They had you the never same saw them in the same box. place. <laughs> yeah, they, they had the it's same true. box. Um, that same box existed in rural Ohio um, for a set number of years. <laughs> I had some favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures. The one that comes to mind is a Leonardo dressed as a samurai. Like, oh, I had that one too. And, like, <laughs> and when you when you, it's the same box. It and when be. you squeeze. When you squeeze the legs, the samurai armor shoots out of his back and flops over the front of him. Um, it was real dope, uh, which it also plays to what my favorite movie was, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, um, where the turtles are back, dot, 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 in time. Oh, um, yeah. Really Your loved, favorite really movie was the third one? <laughs> out of the, that was the one that I remember the most vividly. Um, that was the one that okay. stuck out the most. And... Uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about like weird cuts here, but I've always had a really big, I guess, appreciation of the villain Krang, the <laughs> the, the weird, the weird tentacle uh, meat wad brain monster that lived in that, <laughs> that cyborg's belly. I I just still to this day like that's just really really great. And Krang, so yeah, I Krang is a like just as much a cultural touchstone i think as the four teenage mutant ninja mm-hmm. turtles like right krang when you see krang that that doesn't leave your your brain cavity something uh, special mm-hmm. it, yeah yeah so i kind of doing some of the homework matt that you had shared listening to the theme song just transformed me just took me back took me back dot 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 in time some would say <laughs> so i i'm very excited today because i really there was a special part of my childhood that was collecting teenage mutant ninja turtles and matchbox cars right on yeah i mean i think we all had similar experiences and i think that's most people's experience with the turtles 
as we're going to talk about today, it is truly a generational IP. Uh, every kid has had turtles to grow up with since 1983. So there really is an opportunity for everyone to have that childhood nostalgia of the turtles, which is really kind of cool. I had two older cousins who were both, yeah, give or take like 10 years older than me. And most of my turtle action figures were hand-me-downs from them. So a lot of the like turtle toys that I had weren't so much in line with when I was watching the turtles in the early 2000s. It was the original like turtle mania toys. Um, specifically, yeah. I had a turtle-shaped miniature sewer base so it was like a little turtle oh. that opened up and inside of it was a oh, sewer that base was and it came with whole, minis of everybody that was during the whole Polly pocket and yeah. mighty max yep. phase mighty yeah. Max. Yep. Yeah. Mighty yeah. Max. yeah so we are unfortunately not gonna talk much about toys today and i i say this later on well, too, we already did just top. now we covered it all we yeah. just did and i'm sure we will more in this way but like the Turtles Toys wiki is twice the length of the yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yeah. wiki. Yeah, um, not surprising. Go, um, go listen to go listen to Candare. There, that's exactly they, what I say later in the notes. Yeah, yeah go, cool. go check out our friends at Candare. Yep. Um, they're really good. I mean, like I know all those guys really love the Turtles and really appreciate the collector aspect of it. Um, I got a lot of the information from this flavor text by watching. Season three, episode one of the toys that made us on Netflix, which is all about oh, nice. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So did that one there talk is about a the samurai Leonardo too? <laughs> yep. <laughs> there is a lot of information about turtle toys out there. I'm not gonna give it much of it to you today. Um, but it is really a huge part of the brand. What we are gonna talk about today is the evolution of the turtles from 1983 to here in 2022 considering the most recent Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles release came out like five months ago. So can there, can I quickly talk about um, this wave of nostalgia tied to the turtles did come flooding back. And that was we, every year um, we did like a, we did dare in my school, which I know everyone else here also <laughs> yeah. did dare. Oh, yeah. And every year we watched um, a stupid, like anti drug, like the cartoons fight drugs, uh, movie yeah. and the Teenage Hell Mutant yeah. Ninja Turtles were like semi major, semi main characters in it, and that was like the only Turtles content I consumed until I was a teenager. That's all, Kyle. Oh. Kyle, have you seen uh, Batman versus the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I know it exists, oh. but I haven't seen it. That's a movie for you. That one is for you specifically. Okay. <laughs> um, the the only crossover like that I'm familiar with is the Teenage Mutant Turtles v Power Rangers, which was yeah. We talk about that a later. Whole thing. Oh, I'll it's keep a it whole to thing. Then. We talk about it later. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, the turtles have done a lot of things in 40 years, uh, nearly 50 years at this point that they have been in. Or, nope, math. 40 years that they have been in existence. <laughs> And I'm going to take you through the evolution of the brand. We'll talk a little bit about story from some of the comics and some of the shows, but mostly we're just going to experience how the Turtles came to be because it is a pretty interesting story and it is not the path that a lot of major IPs from the early 80s took to hit it this big. So, No, it's without... the path of the ninja. It is. It is the path of the ninja, but a different path of the ninja <laughs> from other ninja-related properties. Don't laugh at your own joke like that. Get out of here. <laughs> I'll laugh at whatever jokes I want to, Todd. <laughs> so without further ado, let me transport you back. The year was 1983. Scarface, National Lampoon's Vacation, Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, and the thrilling conclusion of the Star Wars trilogy ruled the box office. TV saw the beginning of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, Inspector Gadget, and G.I. Joe, a real American hero. Radios everywhere were blaring Every Breath You Take by The Police, Billie Jean and Beat It by Michael Jackson, and Down Under by Men at Work. Meanwhile, two struggling artists named Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird decided to move in together in Dover, New Hampshire. So... After working together for a little over a year, 
Eastman and Laird declared themselves Mirage Studios, an independent comics company named after the fact that there literally was no studio. It was just Peter Laird's <laughs> living room. Then they <laughs> used that as their business address and referred to the living room as the studio. Eastman and Laird is like, that's a good, that's a good name for a firm. It is. It's yeah. very good. Mm-hmm. So Eastman and Laird had enjoyed working together, but had yet to create an IP strong enough to gain any traction. In November of 1983, while the pair were strung out and exhausted working on their character Fugitoid, Kevin Eastman told his partner Peter Laird <laughs> that he was going to draw something to make him laugh. Do we know, do we know anything else on Fugitoid? It's oh, a, yeah. I it's an 80s ass robot. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's a it's an Astro Boy looking robot. Got I've, it. Got it. Got it. I have seen a lot of things about Fugitoid today. None of them really all that interesting. I feel like if your adult friend sits across from you and is like, "I'm gonna draw something to make you laugh," you're about to be murdered. Is what is about to actually happen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he shows up in TM. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So. He drew a masked bipedal turtle wielding nunchucks and labeled him Ninja Turtle. In the classic <laughs> rules of one upmanship, Laird drew a cooler version, and as the rules state, <laughs> Kevin was then required to draw more turtles, which left them with a group shot of these four Ninja Turtles. And I have which the I have an image of the first two I'll drop in the notes. Um, so listeners, there is not an oh, image page for oh, you this man. week. There really just weren't enough pictures to make it relevant. Um, the four turtles are turtles the whole time. I hate to break it to you. So you can just Google <laughs> it if you want to see something. What's so wow. funny to me about this is the concept of the one drew Ninja Turtle and the other one said, I'm going to draw a cooler one. Because like the joke you would make is, ha ha, give it like some junk food and a skateboard. <laughs> but like, that's that's the that's whole thing. That's what they did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Laird took that drawing of the four turtles, inked it, added the words Teenage Mutant to the title, and the pair decided that this would be their next project. And a little fun fact for you, 29 years later, that original drawing would be sold at auction for $71,700. Only $71,000? I feel like that would be more. Huh. I know. I was a little surprised. In 2010? What if that were an NFT, though? Okay, so anyway, <laughs> comics fans themselves, <laughs> Moving Laird on. <laughs> and Eastman, originally planned Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as a one-shot book, which would parody some of the most popular and their favorite comics of the early 80s. The pair cite Frank Miller's run of DC's Ronin, Dave Sims' Cerebus the Aardvark, and <laughs> Marvel Comics' New Mutants and Daredevil as these inspirations, with the latter being the most important for reasons that will be explained soon. Uh, it's my I'll favorite. give you guys all an opportunity to Google Cerebus the Aardvark. Thank oh, you. how did yep. you know, Matt? Uh, it could have yeah. been that I saw three cursors highlight our Google Doc at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> I've seen I love this art him. style before. I love him so much. He doesn't look like an Aardvark so much he as looks like spider a donkey. Ham. He looks like he spider does look ham. like spider mm -hmm. ham. Uh, Cerebus the Aardvark, written basically to counter and spoof Marvel's uh, Conan the Barbarian. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Right. He's, he's, so, he's a Barbarian weird. Aardvark. He's so sad and salty. I love it. Okay, this one looks mo more like an Aardvark. And then they shortened his nose for, for the same reason they shortened Arthur the Aardvark's nose to make a more friendly character for children. I get it. All right. Well, back to back to the no. This amphibious. is a Cerebus the Ard Ardvark <laughs> podcast. <now. laughs> back to amphibious anthropomorphic heroes. They also needed to name these four turtles. So to stick with the ninja theme, they gave them all Japanese names. However, it never felt right to the authors, and they decided to go with Renaissance artists instead. Inspired by Peter Laird's copy of Jansen's History of Art. They named the turtles Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo, which was actually misspelled with that goofy extra A for like a whole decade. <laughs> nice. Wow. 
It's the original so wild Go ahead. how just like absolutely random and out of nowhere this is. <laughs> yeah, man. You like know what? Todd said, if somebody ever says, I'm going to draw something to make you laugh, like you're going to die. Yeah. And these guys right. made a 40 year IP. Yeah. Good on oh. good on them though for realizing early on that the Japanese names weren't gonna work and like yeah. were, was too right. iffy for for it to continue. Good, good on them. Yeah, what, there was an interview with one of the guys. I, I think it's Peter Laird, uh, and he basically said like we came up with these Renaissance names and we thought well it's just quirky enough to work and it <laughs> did. All things considered. Yeah. So the original turtles all wore red masks as opposed to their now signature blue, red, purple, and orange. Mirage planned to run the book with black and white artwork inside, and they were finding it difficult to differentiate which turtle was which in the art, so each turtle was given their own signature weapon. Leonardo got twin katanas, Raphael got twin size, Donatello got a bow staff, and Michelangelo got nunchucks. They had done it. They had created a comic book <laughs> studio, dreamed up some IPs, and they wrote and illustrated a book. Now they just had to get people to read it. In what some Silicon Valley douchebag would describe as an initial round of investment, the boys used Kevin Eastman's $500 tax return, Peter Laird's last $200, and a $1,300 loan from Kevin Eastman's uncle to, pin- to print 3,275 copies of of Eastman and Laird's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Wow. Wow. They wrote a scene. It was the DIY scene. Fuck. Yeah. Their $1,800 budget left them just enough cash to buy an ad in an industry publication, Comic Buyer's Guide magazine. This ad and the pair's debut at a comic convention in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was enough to generate some serious buzz. There's also a whole bunch of stories about them putting together like handmade home stamped press kits and sending them out to like anybody they could find an address for. That's wild. Yeah. Right. The limited nature of the run made the book an instant collector's piece with copies soon selling for over 50 times the original dollar 50 price tag. If you want one of those first prints now, expect to penny up between twenty five hundred and four thousand dollars. Sure, S- wow. still not. That's not as bad as I would expect for for one of the original three thousand issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's yeah, that's fair. low. That's low. Yeah, from a lot of the things that I read online, because the initial run was so small and it became a collector's piece so quickly. Those original 3,000 plus books have all been really well preserved. So it's not like you're finding one action sure. comics number one from 1948. Mm-hmm. You know, like you they're, just, they're all they're all like known about and accounted for for the most part. Right. Like, yeah, maybe, pretty since, much. Maybe 40 of them are floating around unknown out there. When I guess sense. this was 1984, this was after like collector's items had already been established Mm -hmm. as a thing Mm -hmm. yeah right yeah there was certainly a culture around it at this point so they sold out within weeks and printed another six thousand or so copies these sold out easily as well eastman and laird's teenage mutant ninja turtles premiered in march of 1984 and by may the duo had made enough money to pay back kevin eastman's uncle And split $200 in profit, which, if you're curious, that's like $570 in profit in 2022 money. So, decent money. Almost rent. (laughs) (laughs) Almost a third of the average rent in the United States. While Eastman and Laird had planned for TMNT to be a one-shot, self-contained book, they were smart enough to realize they were onto something. In January of 1985, they completed issue number two and quickly received orders for 15,000 copies, which led to a distributor order of 30,000 copies of a number one reissue. And then number three saw orders around 50,000 copies and orders peaked with number eight at 135,000 copies. Thanks to a guest appearance by, you guessed it, (laughs) Cerebus the Art Bar. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) Are we going to talk much more about Cerebus the Aardvark? I think that's the last time we mentioned the Aardvark podcast now. 
Well, I gotta tell you, he's problematic in his views. He he put he was a star in a comic in 2019 that we'll just call it problematic based upon my my internet search. Well, the more you know. So we we are canceling Cerberus canceling. the artwork is what I'm saying. He's canceled today. Now that you know the story behind the book, let's take a look at the first TMNT comic. This was before the toys, TV shows, movies, and merch. While most of the characters in this book, as well as a number of story beats, have been preserved through the modern era of the Turtles, this first book was, mar was much darker and grittier than what you would expect of TMNT today. Unless, of course, you're Michael Bay, in which case, no one really gives a shit what you think. <laughs> Eastman and Laird had no hesitation about putting their love of Jack Kirby and Marvel Comics' Daredevil front and center. Outside of the general ninjas in New York motif, Eastman and Laird named the turtle Sensei and surrogate father, who is a similarly mutated old ninja rat, Master Splinter in reference to Daredevil's master, Stick. Oh, that's oh, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. 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 Neat. Eastman and Laird also felt that while Daredevil was on the rooftops of New York City fighting the hand, it would make sense for the turtles in the sewer to be warring with the similar but different foot, and thus they That's named their League of Bad Guys the good. Foot Clan. Excellent. Okay, no, I actually, Excellent. I actually don't like that. I, I love I like it. I love it. I hate that. <laughs> I, did, I did know all of this already, and it's uh. very, very good. So these two fun homages aside, the TMNT creators decided to go even more on the nose for the Turtles origin story. And thus, I present to you this reading from the archived Mirage website. And so this is a summary of the first book, but I think that this summary, I mean, obviously it was like written by the guys who wrote the book, but I think that it tells this story better than I could. So I'll, I'll just read it from them. The first issue, where it all began. The book opens with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles battling some 15 gun-toting thugs and mopping up the New York City alleyway with them. Once the police show up, the turtles head for home in the sewer. The TMNT find Master Splinter and tell him of their victory. Splinter decrees that they are now ready to be told of their mission, a mission of retribution. The sensei tells the turtles for the first time their origins. Splinter was once the pet rat. Now, follow this is important. Splinter was once the pet rat of Hamato Yoshi, said to be the greatest shadow warrior of his clan, known as the Foot. While watching Yoshi practice his art of combat, Splinter would mimic his movements and eventually became as adept as his human benefactor. Splinter explains that Yoshi had a bitter rivalry with a fellow clan member, Oroku Nagi. They competed fiercely in all things, even in the matters of the heart. They both fell in love with a beautiful girl named Tang Shen, but she loved only one of them in return, Splinter's master Yoshi. Nagi became extremely jealous, and one night in a fit of rage, he went to Tang Shen's home and demanded that she love only him. She refused, and Nagi began to beat her. Just then, Yoshi came upon them, and in a fit of rage, he slew Nagi. This was a shameful act in the eyes of the Foot Clan, as one member must never kill another. Yoshi had two choices. He could take his own life in ritual suicide and hope for honor in the next life, or he could flee the clan and attempt to start a new life. Master Yoshi decided on the latter and fled to New York City with Tang Shen, Splinter, and a few possessions. He started his own martial arts school, and all went well for years. In Japan, Nagi's brother Saki had sworn vengeance against Yoshi, the man who had killed his sibling. His anger pushed him to become a premier ninja in the foot, and as a reward for his hard work and diligence, the clan sent him to New York City to lead the Big Apple's branch of ninjas. <laughs> Saki recognized this as an opportunity to reap his revenge against Hamato Yoshi and slay him. I want to point out that the two brothers' names um, combined to make Nagasaki, which is not great. Um, yeah, go on. <laughs> I mean, it is a place. It's a it town. is a place. It is a mm -hmm. city. Yeah. you're not wrong. Yeah. But, but it... yes, they could have named it any city in Japan, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Saki quickly built the New York branch of the Foot into a criminal powerhouse involved in many illegal activities, 
from drug smuggling and arms running to their specialty of assassination. But he never forgot his goal. And after a time, he tracked Yoshi and Tang down and set his vengeance into motion. While Yoshi was away at work, Saki broke into his apartment and murdered Tang Shen. Saki lay in wait until Yoshi returned home. As Hamato walked through the door, he saw his dead wife and her murderer, Oroku Saki, who proclaimed himself to be the Shredder. A great fight broke out and Splinter's cage was broken, freeing him. Eventually, the youthful Shredder bettered his older combatant and Yoshi was slain as well. So let me just real quick, the youthful Shredder uh, at this point is the younger brother. Mm -hmm. He yes. kind of becomes immortal later. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Splinter fled to the alleys and lived off of garbage scraps. Scraps anguished over the death of his master. Until the day when a TCRI truck drove by and a strange canister flew out of its hold. The container struck a young man in the head, bounced off the pavement, and smashed into a boy's aquarium filled with turtles. <laughs> <laughs> the shattered glass canister and turtles all fell into an open manhole cover, dropping into the murky sewer below. The metal container held some strange chemical, and when it hit the floor of the sewer, it broke, bathing the turtles in its glowing ooze. Splinter, curious, went to see what had become of the turtles. He collected them into a coffee can and cleaned the glue off them as best he could. The next day, the wise rat found that he and the turtles were mutating, becoming more human-like with each passing day. Eventually, the turtles spoke, and Splinter began to set his own plan for vengeance into motion. He began training the turtles in the art of ninjutsu, and he had... Had, yeah, god damn, he had learned from Hamato Yoshi. He named each turtle after a famous Renaissance artist whose names he had found in an old book, Forsaken in the Sewer. And there you go. There is the <laughs> origin of Teenage Mutant the, Ninja Turtles. It's a and very good origin. It it's is. a very, it's good, a very origin good origin. <laughs> it's a very good origin story, partially because it belongs to Daredevil. Uh, so, <laughs> the young boy <laughs> that that canister bonked in the noggin is supposed to be Matt Murdock. Now, I wasn't Amazing. really sure if this was like official canon or what the story is. So, Marvel and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have never coexisted. There have been some like small little crossover moments here and there and in, in uh, licensed things, but comic publishing has never had them together. So Eastman and Laird love Daredevil and they love that comic. And they have said that like, this is our telling of Daredevil's origin story. And in our canon, that boy who pushed the guy out of the way is Matt Murdock, but he's not the one who got gooed. So mm. it's in theory, the same goo that, that gave Daredevil his blind man powers, but is not actually the same goo. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one question, and I, I know there's not an answer for it, but I have to ask it anyway. So, okay, so you said, like, all these things, like, Master Splinter was sad, and Splinter was, like, after the death of his master, but, like, he was just still, like, a rat. So is that implying that, like, he had full sentience as a, as a pet rat? But the turtles yeah, did well, not. Sentient, sentience, but not necessarily... Um, intelligence right like he was a pet in the same way that like a dog or a cat would be a pet however this is a pet rat that can also mimic his master training i was gonna say i parts. would argue that the, he does have intelligence if he like if he's like remembering and mimicking these like these very articulate movements picking up ninja training yeah yeah um, listen i didn't write hand. the fucking book you guys i uh, i know <laughs> i said there wasn't an answer for it i just i have to ask the question yeah so you know, in the art, because I did go through and read like most of the first comic, the Splinter's originally really small, and he is not always bipedal, although he can do martial arts things. <laughs> and so his mutation is that he becomes more human, becomes bipedal, grows in size, and his wisdom is kind of supposed to be inherent to his time as the pet rat of this ninja master because a lot of Splinter's teachings are like, my master 
Yoshi used to tell me the wind blows harder on your back. Mm. I don't know. I didn't have a quote ready, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, there you go. And this book concludes with the killing of the Shredder. Because again, they were planning on this being a one-off book. Right. So notably absent from this story are the Kawas Bunga, the shell-based catchphrases, and the deep <laughs> obsession with pizza. Oh, sure. I mean, sure. this first this Definitely. first book had not only seppuku, but also a suicide bomb, for God's sakes. Oh, God. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's awesome. a little darker and grittier. Future issues introduce supporting characters like April O'Neil and Baxter Stockman, who debuted oh, in Baxter number two. Baxter Stockman. Yeah. He becomes Casey a fly Jones, man. who debuted. <laughs> That's right. In, That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he is. Casey Jones, who debuted in the Raphael solo book, Me, Myself, and I, and Karai in later volumes. All right. So that is the origin of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That is the first book. And now it is time for the turtles to break into pop culture in an era known widely as Turtle Mania. So one thing I feel like we've all learned by doing these flavor texts is that the real money for comic and cartoon properties is in the toys. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Well, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was no different. So please allow me to introduce you to the first of three beings who could be referred to as the fifth turtle. His name is Mark Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> so Friedman was a licensing agent who expressed interest in wider merchandising opportunities for TMNT to the Mirage guys. They said they were down to clown as long as, quote, they had final creative control. Luckily for everyone involved, Eastman and Laird began to warily make some compromises with Friedman to make the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles IP both more marketable and more kid-friendly. Hence the skateboards and pizza. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Many of the largest toy companies passed on the Turtle IP, but Friedman kept trying. In 1988, he took a meeting with a small toy company that made mostly dolls and plastic playsets, but was looking to break into the action figure market. A deal was struck and production started on a line of toys that would spark an era of American pop culture history known as Turtle Mania. That small toy company was called Playmates. Okay. And just a little fun fact, there was a pre-Playmates license deal for the Turtles with Palladium, who produced a tabletop role-playing game and a couple of 15-centimeter minis. I know now, nothing else about it. I just know that it fun, exists. How fun would a Turtles TTRPG be? <laughs> right. So Turtle Mania would have been dead in the water if not for some major changes to the Turtles IP, which neither Eastman nor Laird were particularly excited about. Eastman said in a 1998 interview for the Comics Journal, and I've copied this verbatim and I've checked it on two different sources and it's kind of gobbledygook, but... The resolution at the end of the day, even when Pete and I both agreed that, well, there's some stuff we really don't like and some stuff that we wish we hadn't said yes to. Stuff that they really wanted to do, but we said, well, we'll always have our black and white comics to tell the kind of stories we want to tell. And that was really the ethos of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles brand and something that Laird and Eastman were really proud of that they kept their original comics books to tell their stories and be the vibe they wanted them to be, while the toys and cartoons could be something different, the movies could be something different, the video games could be something different. I read a quote from one of them, and I forgot to write it down, something along the lines of, like, we got to explore the wackier side of what might happen in our universe, and we've enjoyed that, but we've kept our comics to the original story the whole time. Hmm. Um, which oh. is pretty cool. That is yeah. cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Hmm. I'm surprised so that the... I'm surprised that... Because this is not like... If this were a Marvel property or a Disney property, right? Like, it would be, like, imperative that everything is cohesive. 
yes, and, and right. follows like a brand. So I'm su- I'm actually surprised like the merchandisers were cool with that and were I just mean, like, yeah, this at, can exist in its separately thing. If you look at how the toys came out though, like it's very much a shotgun. Yeah. Like who cares? Like put yeah, put a, right. a pizza gun in Michelangelo's <laughs> stomach because. Yeah. <laughs> Screw it. Like let's shoot around some pizzas. Yeah. Like these dumb idiots in rural Ohio will buy it. Yeah. And we did. And, and we did. And and we would again. Yeah. Kind of the kicker with the whole thing is that the toys and the show marketed to a much, much different audience yeah. than the comic books did. You yeah, know, and and I, mean, I don't I think would not have even expected or could imagine that a comic existed. Yeah, this right. Time. Yeah, I I don't think that anybody had any questions or qualms about that, and I'm guessing that that's where some of the leniency and continuity comes from. So to talk about some of these changes to the IP to make it a little bit more marketable, the biggest aesthetic change for the turtles was the introduction of their signature color scheme. Because the comic turtles all wore red masks, the only way to differentiate the toys would be by their weapons. And now it's hard to believe parents would take issue with introducing their children to weapons at a young age, but toy producers were worried it would scare away buyers. They gave each turtle an accent color and a belt buckle with their initials. There were other various aesthetic changes, which ranged from making the Foot Clan look like dumpy zombies to putting Shredder in a hunched over position just so he could fit inside the toy packaging. Oh, love that. <laughs> it, the other changes, and the one that Eastman and Laird took the most issue with, was the attitude. As noted earlier, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics are dark and aimed at an older audience. Playmates creatives decided to soften the turtles for obvious reasons love it or hate it they were obviously on to something because between 1988 and 1997 playmates produced around 400 figurines and dozens of vehicles and play sets totaling about 1.1 billion dollars in revenue My God. and making tmnt the third best selling toy figurine ever at the time behind only gi joe and star wars wow wow okay. i my brain mashed together a couple of those lines, and I read Playmates produced around 400 billion figurines, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would never have guessed that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was more profitable than, like, Transformers. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of and where my head went, too. Yeah. Like, I would have to okay. guess Transformers is a close three or four though like or four or five though um for the time like that's yeah i imagine it is and honestly like i didn't look too closely i found this cited in a couple of places and decided i was confident in that um i know that tmnt sold gangbusters and a big part of the reason that it didn't catch gi joe and star wars is that those properties started a decade earlier so like right you have to imagine uh an ip coming in 10 years later yeah and almost catching the heels of star wars like that's that's big deal mm-hmm. man yeah So, look, I would love to be able to sit here and pretend like I had enough time to immerse myself into the world of Turtles toys to tell you more about this era. But believe me when I tell you that that is a well so deep it would make even the biggest Bomberman enthusiast shudder. (laughs) TMNT Toys has its own Wikipedia page that's almost double the size of the actual TMNT Wikipedia page. And like we said earlier, if you want to know more about that sort of thing, I really do recommend checking out our friends over at the Canned Air podcast who have forgotten more about the Turtles and its toy lines than I will ever know. Also, again, I I can't recommend enough that Toys That Made Us documentary docuseries on Mm -hmm. Netflix episodes a little over an hour. It's very good or a little under an hour. It's, It's really, really good. All right. So while the real money may be in toys... You obviously need a cartoon to sell your toys. Playmates was inspired by the success of the G.I. Joe, He-Man, and Transformers cartoons, so they called upon animation studio 
Murakami, Wolf, and Swenson to create a five-part miniseries pilot. And I did a little digging into Murakami, Wolf, Swenson to see if they had other things you would recognize. If you were a fan of, like, James Bond Jr. in the 80s, (laughs) you would know (laughs) MWS. The biggest thing that they had was they animated all of the Puff the Magic Dragon specials in the 70s. Oh, okay. But yeah, yeah they he had been kind of cold for a decade or so. Yeah. All right. So that five-part miniseries pilot debuted in December of 1987 and aired three times before finding an audience. Once it gained traction, Playmates ordered more episodes and shit just absolutely popped off the original 1987 cartoon would run for 188 episodes between 1988 and 1996 making sure that turtle mania could continue to rule an entire aisle of every toy store in america um that's like one sixth of a one piece i didn't realize (laughs) i i would have never guessed that there were 188 TMNT like episodes of that series is, that I grew up watching. Now, someone who did grow up watching the show, can you answer this question? Are these 22 minute episodes or 11 minute episodes? Pretty effectively sure. cutting th- that number in half. Ooh. I think they're 11. Okay. Yeah, they might, I honestly they might don't follow the 11. they might follow the 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 Garfield format. Yeah, so like that would be that would be like, what's that? Nine. That would only be like ninety-four uh, individual so, like television blocks. Well, I guess like what's an episode? What are you? This is right. so. Right. This is this is not official, but I'm looking. I just googled TMNT episodes 1987. I see seven seasons, which lines up with the number of years, and each episode is listed as twenty-two minutes. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. Yeah, it looks and like season seven had ten episodes. So I mean, well, let's see here. If we do the math, then so maybe each one counted as two. Well, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That. Yeah. Anyway, they didn't skimp on the voice cast for this bad boy. They had Rob Paulson, famous for doing the voices of Pinky and Yakko Warner, voicing Raphael. Cam Clark voicing Leonardo, who would go on to star as Kaneda in the English dub of Akira. Is the name Kaneda? Did I say that right, Andrew? I'm not seeing is- Akira. I don't know. Oh, really? It was yeah. I. I just assumed it was an anime, and you had seen it. I'm sorry. We that all was, did mad. It was. Fine. It was fine. wrong of me to assume your anime. I apologize. And James Avery of Fresh Prince fame voicing Shredder. James Avery was Uncle Phil. Yeah, let's oh. let's point out oh. that these were not. These were not good big gits at the time. These were all up and coming actors at the time. Um, like Fresh Prince didn't come out until ninety. So, um, yeah, but I mean, pe- James Avery had a career before Fresh Prince, um, and I think mm-hmm. that this was a pretty. I think Rob Paulson was the big git. I mean, he's the the lead. Yeah. Uh, like he has lead billing. Right. He's got a huge voice resume. Yeah, oh, he was sure. uh, Yakko Warner in Animaniacs. Yeah, yeah, he's, um, oh, it, uh, all I can think of is Tom Segura, and that's not it. Um, <laughs> the guy who voiced SpongeBob. Tom Kenny. Uh, Tom Kenny, thank you. Uh, Rob Paulson is Warner Brothers Tom Kenny. Yeah. Anyway, the cartoon introduced the world to the newer, softer, more radical Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is where we get the turtles people know as well as some of the most hotly contested characters in the turtle universe, Bebop and Rocksteady, and Krang, the stomach blob man. Oh, yes. love, <laughs> love my little wrinkly son. <laughs> I really like Bebop and Rocksteady. Mm-hmm. Anybody who is a fan of the Turtles comics hates Bebop and Rocksteady. Kevin Eastman and really? Peter Laird hate Bebop and Rocksteady. Man. Yeah. Um it's just so much so fun. fun. Yeah, they're so fun and dumpy. And that's the thing, is that, like, Eastman and Laird never wanted Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to be a dumpy thing, you know? And yeah. and that's, like, one of their biggest arguments with the cartoon is that they made Shredder into your typical bumbling cartoon villain, because that's yeah. what cartoons were in the 80s. And, like, 
you know, they wanted their villains to have a sense of intimidation and uh, in the original comics lines, they weren't mutating other people into anthropomorphic animals and stuff. And so I I really like he was just Skeletor, but with a different skin. Like, yeah, it, it and like he definitely ended up having what was it? Inspector Gadget's villain, Dr. Claw, like like a lot of like my plans foiled again. Yeah, energy. yeah, like, yeah. I'll, I'll, curse, I'll, I'll curse you, Ninja next Turtles. Time. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So interestingly enough, though, Krang is actually based on someone from the comics, or I, I shouldn't necessarily say someone. I should say something. Uh, Krang is based on, I believe, it's the Or Orlum, or I think it's called Orlum. It's a race of aliens that is actually from the Fugitoid comics but oh. created the chemical that TCRI transported that transmuted the turtles. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that Krang is from the future. I know there's definitely like... <laughs> no, like, like, and I get that stupid to say out loud. I think cause there's definitely a... There's a plot line where other soldiers come from the future and i'm pretty sure like krang is in cahoots with the moon and they're like oh our general he's like yes my I, my people <laughs> i always kind of took krang as like the teenage mutant ninja turtles version of apocalypse but like shitty <laughs> <laughs> i think he's you know? supposed to, he's supposed to be more like ultron um okay mm. but i'll be completely honest when i was a kid and up until i was really into Marvel shit when I was like 15. I thought that Krang and Modok were the same. I did not know that I mean, there was a difference between that, these I characters. Mean, that's fair. That's fair. very fair. Yeah. They they kind of are cut from the same cloth. I, I don't mean I don't I hate to interrupt you, but I do need to point out that I, I spent a lot of time it. I had to find the pizza <laughs> the pizza Michelangelo <laughs> toy. Well, and and it's, pizza it's, it's pizza tossing. It's better than I remember. His eyes are all like <laughs> bug out, and he's got like a slice of pizza, like he's chomping a cigar, hanging outside his mouth. It's <laughs> perfect. It. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> Excellent. Good find for sure. Okay. Um, now we can back to the flavor text. <laughs> <laughs> back to the 1983 cartoon. Uh, this cartoon rules in the way that mid '80s cartoons written explicitly to sell toys do. That said, the theme song was written and partially performed by Big Bang Theory creator Chuck Lorre, and that's I also certainly not did nothing. Know, <laughs> I did also know <laughs> that great. part of Chuck Lorre lore. Um, it's yeah. So, good. so if you go, if you go back and listen to the TMNT theme song, which was part of the, your your homework for this flavor text. Between music lines, when there's just somebody saying, like, it's radical, that's Chuck Lorre. Yeah. That's, like, his Good. first TV credit, too. It's, like, it's uh-huh. like the reason yeah. we have a Chuck Lorre. Yes. Chuck <laughs> Lorre is to the 1983 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as Kevin Feige is to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that was a joke Great. for Todd. He laughed at it. Cool. Anyway... I, I While the writers were careful to make the show less violent, it didn't come without controversy. In the UK, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was renamed to Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles because apparently the British are way less cool with ninjas. Also, (laughs) turns out nunchucks are outlawed in the UK. So all of Michelangelo's fight scenes were cut and he was relegated to being the grappling hook guy. Oh, He's the grappling hook guy. Yeah. Very good. Because it's another spinny weapon. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Huh. There was that's also got, a... That's got big, like, Brock taking out his favorite jelly donuts. Yes. In yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly that. <sighs> so there was also a series of officially licensed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle video games, both in arcades and home consoles. The biggest standout of these was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the NES which was released in 1989. Developed by Konami, it featured Metroidvania-style levels separated by more beat-em-up-style overhead levels. It sold about 400 million copies, making it the 11th best-selling NES game and the number one third-party NES game. 
Yeah. It was sold for a time as a pack and bundle, but it's likely the game drew more buyers it, than the system. Everybody did. had that game. Everybody yeah, had that yeah. game. So I was just getting ready to ask mm-hmm. if if any of you have played that game. Um, and if you have played that game and you or you've watched anyone on the internet play that game, you know that the underwater level was yep. unforgiving. Mm-hmm. It was I do know. I, yeah, I but... had Yeah, I had this game. Uh really liked this game, and I'm positive that like young Todd never passed the water level, like never, never yeah. made it. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the NES is one of the first games I ever beat. Uh, nice. I, yeah. Just so get, get fucked. Young yeah, Todd. Just- <laughs> I, I don't, I had an NES, but I wasn't forming long term memories at the time. So I don't know <laughs> if we had TMNT. I played a lot of duck hunt and a lot of Mario on it. And then we got rid right. of it. Um, I didn't so. have an NES. My next door neighbor did, but he, they had this game for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't really get into any more video games, which doesn't leave me any time to talk about Turtles in Time. Turtles in Time. Turtles in yeah, Time. Yeah, man. Greatest <laughs> game. So we're not quite to the SNES part of the, the timeline here, and I don't go back to talk about it, but Turtles in Time, one of the best games for the Super mm-hmm. Nintendo, straight up. The new yeah. the new Switch game is very highly rated yeah. as well. Yes, and it's on it's really Game Pass. Good. It's on Game Pass. Oh, it's not just Switch. Okay. It's on everything. It's on everything, gotcha. but yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, it's really good. There's also, uh, this is a weird pull, but if you got the pack-in Double Dash game for the GameCube, you also got a demo disc that came with the Ninja Turtles beat em up for the GameCube, and I don't remember what the title of that game was, but it was really awesome, and I played that demo <laughs> disc a lot. I never bought the real game. I just rented it from Giant Eagle a lot, but it was really good. Um, the last one to add in, there was also a Tournament Fighters game on Sega that i really owned. yes and it was a very very good punch em. is it just like um just mortal kombat street fighter, but, street yeah, fighter street, but with turtles street fighter yeah. mortal kombat um and i the the cover had Raphael on it and like the the boss at least the boss that i got to before i got punished as like a second grader for not being good at games was uh, a giant <laughs> tri- a giant triceratops man um, and he was very mean, and I remember that vividly. Who, who did who did you main, Todd? Um, I think that I mained either Donatello or Raphael. One of them, Donatello had better reach. Raphael had a special that he could like fling energy waves. Hmm. I think they all might have had that. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what I went with. Uh, hmm. I wanted to play as Casey Jones more because he could like drop bombs mm-hmm. and stuff, but like he's a nerd and it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, nobody likes Casey Jones. I feel like I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the Konami arcade game, like 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. Right. I, also, just an incredibly good classic arcade game. Everybody plays as Donatello. That's just the right <laughs> answer. <laughs> so, yes. the NES TMNT game is the reason that uh, Donatello is my favorite turtle because he had the better reach. And that yeah, was right? really important in that game. Um, uh, if you get the power, wait one more thing about that game. If you get the power up star, um, your your turtle rolls into a ball with just its weapon sticking out. Um, I don't know what the power up star is. Probably pizza. I don't know. But if you have Donatello, your reach is like three times as far as yeah. Raphael. Yeah, and you're just a bouncing a bouncing turtle shell with a weapon sticking out, just like slashing people, just off. whapping so things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Um, the I'm a little upset that Andrew said nobody likes Casey Jones because I said my favorite turtle is Donatello, I, but my favorite turtle character is Casey Jones. Mm-hmm. I yeah, love I Casey. I feel Jones. like Andrew's wrong about am that. I, is, is that, that a, am, is that a hot take? I think it's a hot take. take. Yeah. Um, okay. I'd be remiss if we didn't bring up uh, Walkabout the Swagman. So <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Walkabout <laughs> the Swagman. All right, uh, that's enough. At this point, TMNT has a successful comic series, a successful cartoon and an explosive toy line, and has been merchandised on literally anything you could ever want. I had a backpack. Right. And also oh, a yeah. mirror. Backpack, um, my, my backpack lunch Mirror at home. Yep. There was only one major media left to cover, and in 1990, TMNT would do just that with the release of its first live-action movie. 
So with the series at the absolute peak of commercial commercial success, a screenplay was adapted from the original comic. While the plot and tone of the movie are more in line with the Mirage comics, it also adapted elements from the cartoon, including the turtles' colors, their love of pizza, and April O'Neil being a news reporter and kind of a bumbling damsel in distress, which I think it's Peter Laird has said in a bunch of interviews is one of the most upsetting things about the modern turtles to him mm, as that um, he never wanted April O'Neil to be like a news reporter. Uh, April O'Neil is actually introduced as a, an assistant in Baxter's lab. Um, and she's, Big booby comic science girl, but she's smart and that makes it okay. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. I don't think that April O'Neil is that terrible in the 90, 90s movie compared to some of her other adaptations. Appearances, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The movie is so wonderfully 1990, but it works for some very specific reasons, none of which are the moments of very thinly veiled homophobia. Steve Barron, who directed the music videos for Billie Jean, Take On Me, and Money For Nothing, really just crushes directing this movie. But the real hero here is Jim Henson and his Creature Shop. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. Always, it's always the hero. The real hero is always <laughs> Jim Henson and his Jim Creature Henson, Shop. Jim Henson, right. Yeah, so Jim Henson would pass away later that year, making Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one of the last projects he worked on. He said that the turtle costumes were the most advanced puppetectronics that he had ever worked on. Just to create the facial expressions, a single puppeteer would use a joystick for the eyes, an electronic glove to work the jaws, and a headset with infrared sensors tracking the puppeteer's face to work the lips. That's wow. amazing. Yeah. So I know that we were talking earlier about whether or not we had seen this movie you can watch this movie right now for free on one of my personal favorite streaming apps, Tubi TV. Tubi um, TV. <laughs> yeah, man. It's available. All three of them are. You can watch Secrets of the Ooze oh, and Back in Time. I might have to do that. Uh, yeah. Matt, will, you, will you be talking at all about, what is it, the 2014 movie? Because I have to. Yeah. <laughs> I just, we'll get there. I, We're, it's... The, okay, God, the year wait. is 1990. Yeah, Keep it to I, yourself, well, man. I want to I say in the good years. Let's say in the yeah. good time. Can we talk about Hey Ninja, Hey Ninja, Hey, Hey Ninja, Hey Ninja, Hey? <laughs> you, mean, it, you mean the Vanilla Ice hit? Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Ninja rap? Van <laughs> yeah. Vanilla Ice's Hey Ninja, Hey Ninja, Hey walked so that Eminem's Venom <laughs> could run. <laughs> Excellent. Oh God! It's go ninja, go ninja, go. Oh, first off, okay. Did yeah. that make it better though? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. It, it is a little bit better. Sorry, continue. <laughs> so, what I wanted to say was, if you want to go watch this movie, it's on Tubi TV, and I really can't say enough about the practical effects in this movie. Even forty years later, thirty years later, I can't do math today. Even thirty years later knowing that the turtles are all animatronics like you can see it and you know it but the movement of the face is insane it's really okay. so cool um and it's not as good in the other two movies so definitely watch the first one if you want to look for the puppeteering yeah the first thing they did mm -hmm. to like increase their profits on the next two movies was can jim henson from making the pup the suits because that was mm. easily the most expensive part of the budget for the first one right yeah well and i mean not to be crass but jim henson died and well uh, but his creature uh, shop his creature shop didn't it did get sold off mm -hmm. i guess so that yeah but it, i mean it scaled way back in those first few years without jim henson and Anyway, the first movie had some real ringers um, in the cast. Corey Feldman voicing Donatello and Kevin Clash, better known as the voice of Elmo, voicing Master Splinter. Huh. Kevin Clash, the not a good person. I'm pretty sure he's done some some child child related crimes. He's also canceled like Cerberus the Aardvark. Yep. <laughs> Just like yeah. Cerberus the Aardvark. Uh, which I just now realized that I've been saying 
Cerebus this whole time. I think it's Cerebus. It looks like Cerebus, but I, I don't... I think Todd is wrong. It's Cerebus. What did I say? You said Cerberus. You said Cerberus? Like, um... You know, who's to say? Like, like, uh... Like the, like the multi-headed dog. Isn't it spelled like yeah. Cerberus? I think that I think it's missing a syllable. I think it's only Seraphis. Yeah, it's not Martin Sheen. He's not Martin Sheen. I think we're losing the thread here, guys. <laughs> we super are. Okay, so the first Ninja Turtles movie was made on a pretty tight budget, considering the quality of the special effects, costing the studio only $13 million. It made its money back no problem and would earn more than $200 million worldwide in 1990 money. It was the return. ninth. What was that, huh? Well, uh. That's a pretty good return. It is, yeah. yeah. It was the ninth highest grossing movie of 1990 and the highest grossing independent movie ever at the time. Adjusted for inflation, it made about $150 less than Iron Man did. $150 million, wow. $150 million left, less? Yeah. <laughs> In hopes of capitalizing on the popularity of the movie, a sequel... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Secret of the Ooze, was released in 91, and TMNT 3 was released in 93. The Secret of the Ooze was rushed and had a lighter tone, and despite an immaculate performance by Vanilla Ice, it never lived up to the original. TMNT 3 was aimed at the Japanese market, and it was bad. Todd, your give thoughts? Me a, give, me a, give me a time travel I, story, and I'm in. Look, I feel the same way I feel about... Secret of the Uses Todd does about back in time. These again, we were five, so right. give us the benefit of the doubt. Um, also, I liked Batman and Robin when it came out. I was ten. Yeah, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was. It was. I for liked me. Phantom Menace when it came yeah. out. Like I it get was it. made for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Luckily, sequels aren't the only way to capitalize off a new thing. The live action animatronic turtles were used heavily in advertising and marketing including my personal favorite way, the live-action turtles often entered into commercials to present their plastic toy counterparts. <laughs> <laughs> the commercials are awesome. <laughs> and then somewhere along the line, someone said, what if we made it a musical? And do coming out of their shells, the stage show was born. A soundtrack album and VHS of the show were released, Pizza Hut sponsored a 40 city tour wow. and they performed on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> every sentence, every every additional sentence and word in that paragraph is just dates it harder and harder for it. Um, yeah, right. I mean, this was like around like this was around the time where like such and such on ice was so common. Mm -hmm. It was a punchline. Um, also, I'm just imagining like a entire tmnt parody of the killer's song um with starting with the line coming out of their shells coming out of their shells and i've been doing <laughs> but that's good that's all i got well that takes us to the year 1995 ish 1996 and that's where we're going to take a quick break so when we come back we're going to talk about what came after the years of turtle mania and talk a little bit more about where the Turtles brand is today. So stick around. I'm Aubrey. I'm Dennis. And I'm Johnny. Every other Tuesday, we take an in-depth and humorous look at different comic books. We're talking indie comics, capes and cowls, and everything in between. Graphic Novel Explorers Club is available on all platforms. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to tell your friends if you have any. All right, welcome back. We're going to finish out our flavor text here on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and... To be honest with you, this is the depressing part. This part doesn't feel so good, and I'm sorry uh -huh. for that. We're going to finish with good vibes. Well, that's a lie. I'm going to give you a bad, good, bad sandwich here. Um, sorry. Anyway, so Turtle Mania came to a close in 1996 when the original cartoon was canceled. With that metaphorical end, the movie trilogy was also over. The cartoon was done, and toy sales were beginning to shift. Meanwhile, in the background, tension started to grow between Eastman and Laird, who, as all creative partners do, 
were just running the course of their creative venture together. Sure. In 1997, folks from Sabin Entertainment expressed interest in keeping the turtles on TV. Sabin had plenty of experience with characters in masks and rubber suits from their successful run of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which started in 1993. Well, folks mustered up enough cocaine to make Ninja Turtles the next mutation happen. <laughs> the show ran for one year and 26 episodes because it was bad. Marketing touted it as a continuation of the 87 series, which it certainly was not. Mm -hmm. The Turtles' weapons were all changed. It also introduced the second entity referred to as the fifth turtle, Venus de Milo, a female uh -huh. turtle complete oh, with wide no. hips and very strange and, shell breasts. And turtle I boobs. Knew about, yep. Yeah, oh. I remember. So when you mentioned, you know, could be the fifth Ninja Turtle, I remember Venus. And I know there's another one too, but I remembered Venus. She's got a weird sassy pose. I didn't know this existed. This looks like dog yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people like this. Collectively, yeah. everyone went, no. Yeah. No. So... I, I don't remember which one it was. It was either Kevin Eastman or Peter Laird. I think it was Kevin Eastman said in an interview that he didn't truly regret any of the licensing and marketing deals they made, except for the next mutation. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's it, the one thing that everybody agrees on is bad. It looks like Clay Fighter. <laughs> Do you know? yeah. It super it does. does look like Clay Fighter. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Um, the show ran in tandem with Power Rangers in space and saw a number <laughs> of crossovers between the teams. Uh -huh. While this was done in hopes of revitalizing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles brand, it came off more as a sad passing of the torch to the Power Rangers, the new martial arts-based toy franchise. <laughs> yeah, so I remember that crossover with the Power Rangers and the whole thing was um, the Ninja Turtles showed up and they were being mind controlled. So they were the bad guys. And then in the uh, end, the power of friendship X, Y, Z. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah, then yeah. like one of the biggest issues with the next mutation is that it really cranked up the dial on how big of bumbling idiots the turtles are, which like yeah. I was kind of telling Maddie last night when we were watching the nineties movie that one of the more fun things about the turtles is that, they're actually like really good at this and yeah. they just kind of exist to fight bad guys, you know, like <laughs> yeah. the power Rangers and a lot of other teams always have this, like we're teens at school, but we have these powers that we have to use. And the turtles are like, we're sewer ninjas. We fight other <laughs> sewer ninjas. And I love that. Uh, and so the next mutation really just like, wasn't that through all that uh, out the window. Was yeah. Yeah. Do so now that you've talked about uh, Venus de Milo. Do you talk about the other uh, new Ninja Turtle, the other fifth one, Jenica? Man, Todd, if you would just be patient, you would <laughs> learn so many things. You would just have a palate. You would just have a pump the brakes, Todd. So as the tides waned for the TMNT franchise, Kevin Eastman expressed interest in leaving the property behind. Peter Laird stated that he would, quote, never sell his shares, and eventually it was worked out that Eastman sold his shares to his former partner, making Laird the sole proprietor of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Luckily for Laird, Warner Brothers' rebranding of their Saturday morning cartoon block opened a new door for the brand, and a new animated turtle series was created by 4Kids Entertainment. And it's really good. It's really good, you guys. This is the Turtles that I grew up on. Uh, so this started in 2003. It's a very good mm. modernization of the 87 Turtles, and it ran for seven whole seasons. Um, so I was like, I really w like WB, this. four kids, why don't I know about this? It's because it's like right, at the t right when I aged out of Saturday morning yeah. cartoons. Yeah. This is like, this was peak... Saturday, I was in third grade when this shit came right. on TV, and I could not get enough of it. And I had watched a lot of the 90s cartoon Turtles. I mean, we had um, the, the 400 channels that had all the ancient cartoons that you could watch, which is why I was really into Magilla Gorilla. Um, but <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the 
2003 cartoon is really awesome, and it spawned a movie. And I need you guys' help to come up with a phrase here. I, I left question marks in. I originally said that the movie it spawned was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles' first Crisis on Infinite Earths story. And then I thought, maybe it's more of a Sonic Origins-style story. Either way, it's called Turtles Forever. It came out in 2009, and it saw the OG Comics Turtles, the 87 Turtles, and the 03 Turtles all fighting side by side in a mashed up mm. timeline. It's the, it's the like, it's the soft reboot. You know, it's a so, it's another soft reboot. It's like um, Days of Future Past, the, the movie, um, I think I think soft reboot is the best verbiage you're gonna get for it. Um, there or a passing of the torch episode... reboot. Well, I, are you asking what to call it when they bring all of the iterations when they, together? Yeah, like when they bring old iterations back and they all buddy buddy together. Yeah, so Netflix. there. I don't. No. <laughs> so I don't. I would have to look up the answer, but there were episode, there was an episode or episodes now at this point of Power Rangers where it would bring all of the dimensions of Power Rangers together for like a big team up. And it's that. That's what um, yeah, yeah, whatever think, that is. I think Doctor Who did it all first if we're being, if we're being those like kinds of pedantic nerds. I like that nerds. better. I That's like that. really what I was looking for is like, where did, who did this first? And I couldn't, yeah. Doctor Who is a great example. I didn't even think of it. Crisis on Infinite Earths was the only other mm -hmm. thing Teenage that I could Mutant Ninja of. Smash Brothers. Yes, <laughs> it is that. Uh, while the animated series was running on TV, before Turtles Forever came out, a standalone CGI film called TMNT was released in 2007. And it was super rad. Yeah, I was working at a movie theater at the time. Yeah, this is I was the only person I knew who liked this movie. Is is this when Nickelodeon picked up the IP the license? We're getting there. Okay, this isn't yet. Okay, got it. It's like, yeah. This is like the last thing before that. This is the last thing before noted. Yeah. So uh, I lost my place again. TMNT came out in two thousand and seven. It's very good, and I don't think it's unfair to say that it saved the Turtles brand. The movie was a little darker than the show and had an absolutely insane cast, which included Patrick Stewart and Kevin Smith as bit roles, Chris what? Evans as Casey Jones, Sarah what? Michelle Gellar as April O'Neil, Lawrence Fishburne as the narrator, and James Arnold Taylor as Leo, Nolan North as Raph, Mikey Kelly as Michelangelo, and Mitchell Whitfield as Donatello. Those last four are all pretty that big is, voice actors. That is oh. Nolan, Nolan North showing up in two flavor text in as as many um, weeks james arnold taylor who is uh uh g gordon godfrey and barry allen in young justice so there you go oh my yeah. gosh right. yeah i mean all these are just the guys on warner brothers retainer it's, it's, yeah uh, right yep. yeah so here it is for you andrew the movie was so successful that it caught the eyes of some very important people those people just happen to have a big enough wallet to make Peter, I'll never sell my shares, Laird, sell his shares. And in 2009, the TMNT IP was sold to Viacom Nickelodeon for about $60 million. Ooh. I Yeah, that, wonder that's a deal much, I'd make. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wonder how much Eastman sold his shares to Laird for. Mm -hmm. they, they talk about it in the Toys That Made Us uh docuseries i tell you what less than 60 million dollars <laughs> yeah, 60 million I would, yeah i would imagine yeah um yeah if this if in 20 years someone wants to give me 60 million dollars for the rights to de to my portion of the rights to debate this uh I'll see you guys um <laughs> when when you bought ours out for beans when I, yes after after <laughs> yeah. i've bought yours out for for a mint for a song yeah yeah, <laughs> I can't honestly think of anything I own that I wouldn't sell for sixty million dollars. Oh if God. we're being really honest, I'm. Yeah. You could you could take that down, to take 60. a zero off of that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Move that True decimal story. point a, a couple spaces. And that brings us to the modern era of the turtles post the Viacom Nickelodeon acquisition, and 
unlike a lot of corporate takeovers and acquisitions, Viacom and Nickelodeon has been really good to the TMNT brand. It's been running with relative success. A new animated series aired in 2012 with Jason Biggs, Sean Astin, Rob Paulson, what? and Greg Grace, <laughs> wow. best known as voicing <laughs> Beast Boy and Teen Titans, Stacked voicing cast. Leo, Raph, Donnie, and Mikey, respectively. Samwise Gamgee is in this reboot? That's yeah, amazing. man, and that series ran through 2017. Nickelodeon I mean, this is, aired... Oh, go ahead. This is, this is like right after Avatar and like right when Nickelodeon is like, man, this teen-based, this teen-aimed show um, is is really popular it's just not selling the merch we want what if we do that to a to a property that so, has sold almost the most merch ever um i bet we'd make a lot of money um so it really makes sense is what i'm getting at good job good job nickelodeon goodbye like right like what is 60 million dollars for an ip that generated 1.1 billion in toy sale in, revel revenue alone right. in less yeah, than a decade. Insanity. Yeah. 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 So Nickelodeon aired a newer style 2D series called Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from 2018 to 2020. And that got a follow-up movie this year. I'll be honest, I don't know much about it, but it does seem to be pretty good. Um, it is an origin story. It's kind of a... A, a pup named Scooby Doo of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, <laughs> if you will. Is a pup named Scooby Doo an origin? I always thought it was just Muppet Babies. It's, well, a, pre yeah, it's, it's no, a prequel. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Is it it's a prequel? prequel. Yeah, it's it's a baby. It's a I Muppet really Baby. Care? It's a, yeah. Muppet. Ba okay, I don't care. I don't care. Let's move on. <laughs> Are we about to argue with the canon of Muppet Babies? It's, Is that what we're about to do? It's not lore. It's not canon. The, the Muppets. The Muppet movie showed them being the, meet, meeting the, together the, as the, an adults. As adults, the, they were all adults when they met. The Muppet Babies are like it's not, the Teen Titans to Young Justice. They both exist in different, different universes, similar right. universes. This is absurd. I hate this show. <laughs> Even though Kevin Eastman sold his shares, he was quickly tapped as a writer for the new TMNT comic series in 2011 when the publishing rights shifted to IDW Publishing. Huh. That's that series is still running and has, from what I can tell, been really well received. It introduced the third fifth turtle in 2019, a human turned mutant tur turtle lady named Jenica. Her design is much better than Venus de Milo's. Well, she's got, got Wolverine claws. Yeah, she does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she, she, yeah that's if awesome. You, now here here's if if you haven't read the wiki about her. If you had to guess how we found a brand new turtle that is a ninja that just shows up <laughs> and is and is conveniently timed to a Netflix or a uh, Disney Plus series that's about to debut soon as of this recording, how would you guess that that this woman gets her turtle powers? Uh, if you I'm, guess, I'm, if you I'm guess looking blood at it. Yeah. If you guess blood transfusion, then you might be right. <laughs> blood blood transfusion from a different Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, then yes. Oh, good. There's yeah, only one good. story to be told. It's the same story. <laughs> so there, there are only 36 original stories, and the rest are, are and just they picked variations the Morbius on one. <laughs> and they picked Morbius. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, yeah, She's, she looks so, at Leo as he's as he's giving the infusion, and, and she goes, "Make it make count." It count. <laughs> uh, oh, that was no, so she, well done. She is dope. I like her a lot. Yeah. So Jenica was a human love interest of Casey Jones, uh, who was a member of the Foot Clan, and uh, it was kind of this like, you know, Romeo Juliet. We're not supposed to be in love, but we are kind of situation. And then they turned her into a turtle. And I don't really know where Casey Jones stands on that. I was, <laughs> was going to ask. This is a very like a variation of the if would you still love me if I turned into a worm question. Uh, does I Casey think, Jones yeah. still love her when she turns into a turtle? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, the I think what what Matt is meaning to say is that Leonardo's blood is turning all the ninjas into turtles. They're and that's where we are now. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, oh that's, that's what we're doing. Yeah. That's what we were yeah. doing. We're doing an Alex Jones. Okay. Hey, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, the Turtles brand is still going strong, and I guess I forgot to talk about the Michael Bay movies, didn't I? Did uh, you? Uh, beans. <sighs> So in 2014, Nickelodeon teamed up with Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes partners to once again make the turtles ride the coattails of the Transformers. While doing press in 2012, Michael Bay announced that the movie would be called Just Ninja Turtles and that their origin story would be changed as they would be aliens instead of mutants. Well, is that real? That is real. Yeah. I remember that. I, I was working at... I was I was working at a movie theater when both both of the recent movies oh. came out, and this was a man. People were mad. People were so yeah, because mad. Why? It's wild to Michael think Bay about is the dumb. <laughs> it's wild to think about back to the Obama years when like this is the thing that Twitter got upset about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Twitter was still so days? fresh and new. Yeah, I was still yeah. tweeting like just ate food. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can imagine how Instead 30 of years. It, it's Ted Cruz that he fits his pants. <laughs> yeah. And then he yes. comes out of his mouth. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> We've time stamped this. Uh, <laughs> God damn. <sighs> okay. <sighs> anyway. You can imagine how 30 years of fandom reacted to that. And that movie got ugly sonic back to a more canonical adaptation. <laughs> I love I've seen this movie one time. It's not great. Oh. The cast, though, is buck wild with Johnny Knoxville voicing Leonardo. Right? <laughs> Megan That's Fox what, is uh, April O'Neil. Of course. Tony Shalhoub voicing Splinter. Tony and... Shalhoub! <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. And Will Arnett as some guy named Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so wait, a couple a couple things just super quick. Sure. You shared you shared the video earlier of like the avalanche scene, which I still stand is fun. Not very good. I <laughs> I was like, okay, uh like Will Arnett's in this movie, fine. Megan Fox is April O'Neil O'Neill. I thought I was like, oh, Will Arnett is some really tough on his luck forty year old vir virgin <laughs> of like you know, Casey Jones. Casey and then Jones. he just told me his name is Vernon. It's just Vernon. <laughs> and also, Johnny Knoxville's a voice actor in this movie. I I guarantee what happened was they wanted Will Arnett to voice like Raphael or something, because he's got the good mm. like the the Lego Batman voice. He's got the good like gravelly yeah. uh and he's and he he re read the script and he's like, I'm not doing that. I'm not voicing this this turtle. I'm do something else, and they had to like write in mm -hmm. this part for him because Vernon, Vernon, he is uh April O'Neill's cameraman, um, okay. and that's it. I don't like, dude, you had Casey Jones right there, you okay. know, like there are six characters, well, there are eight characters in the Turtles canon that matter, right? Shredder, Splinter, the four turtles, Casey Jones, April O'Neill, that's it, that's the whole damn gang, and like. What did you, who the fuck is Vernon, Michael Bay? Vernon. Who is who is Vernon? Well, we needed um, a different white guy, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There weren't enough weren't enough white guys in this in this property right. for Michael Bay. Tony Shalhoub is still the one that really <laughs> gets me. Incredible. Tony like, really fun. Is so Tony good. Shalhoub is Splinter is nuts. Oh. And if you look at the casting on IMDb, you have to scroll to the right to see all of it, and he is a surprise entrance when you scroll. <laughs> You're like, all right, all of this makes sense. What? <laughs> Monk, there was, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> there was a sequel released in 2016 called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, colon, there Out of was? the Shadows. Yeah, yeah, there sure was. I it's... haven't seen it. I don't think I need to. The best part of both of these movies was a six-minute downhill avalanche fight scene in the first one. YouTube that and save yourself five hours. To to put it in terms, um, at least that I know, at least Matt will understand. Um, I believe the I believe TMNT out of the shadows is the Ghost Rider spirit of vengeance of of <laughs> two movies. <laughs> oh, 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 no. You know what? I I take it back. I did see this one because the actor that plays 
Green Arrow in Arrow plays oh, Casey Jones. Yep. I did hey, see this yep. one. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. <laughs> the voice of Krang was Brad Garrett from Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, no. America was a mistake. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, it got a 6 out of 10 on IMDb. So. Hey, but that said, it's got a 37% on Rotten Tomatoes. And to put that into perspective, the 2017 Power Rangers re- reboot has a 51% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. So, two, two more points to bring in. Uh, Will Arnett <laughs> does reprise his role as Vernon. And uh, <laughs> Tyler Tyler Perry plays Baxter Stockman. So, no, the fly, Tyler the fly, man. Perry. <laughs> Oh, wow, man. I'm I'm just like scrolling through this cast <laughs> this now. It's so bonkers. Incredible. All right, well that is now officially all I know about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I wanted to save these Garrett. last minutes for your final thoughts and also to talk about any favorite bad TMNT cartoon ripoffs you may have. <laughs> My I... favorite is the Street Sharks. Oh, oh yeah, Street Sharks is good. That's a good answer. Street Sharks I... is good. I really liked this, and I thank you for sharing all this with us, Matt. I have gone through a wave of nostalgia. So I think my favorite flavor texts are when they, like, speak to something deep within me and, like, transform me back to, like, a very specific memory. And when you were talking about how there was just a time where the Ninja Turtles were on everything, shoes, clothes, lunch boxes, toys, like, I am transformed back to my kindergarten year i had a teenage mutant ninja turtle lunchbox and like i vividly remember like that the teenage mutant turtles were like such a vital part of my just growing up experience and so i love all of this um much like the phoenix rises from the ashes of its former <laughs> self i do mm-hmm. at some point hope that, that the turtles again stand in the light um Man, I'm. I'm I mean, really the, if you ask, if you ask anyone who's watching the Nickelodeon shows, they are standing in the light. The Nickelodeon shows are supposed to be very good, right? I'm, I'm just dealing with the brother from Everybody Loves Raymond voicing Craig. Like, that's just really, <laughs> it's it's stuck yeah. with me, and I can't get out of that. But this is very, very good. Um, and I, I guess I didn't realize how much Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles meant to me growing up. Um, I would echo what you said about Street Sharks. Love Street Sharks. Um, <laughs> it's not quite a spinoff, but Gargoyles. Gargoyles. Ah, Gargoyles also good. Yeah. 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 Personal favorite. That's I had that one. Sega video game and I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have another example because Street Sharks and Gargoyles were my two uh, <laughs> that I thought of, but I do. I would like to leave everyone with the idea that the turtles most represent an ain't like an old like storytelling slash like psychology mechanic called the four temperaments, yeah. which all goes back to like, uh, like the, like beast, like Greek physician, hypocrite, 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 <laughs> Hippocrates, Jesus, <laughs> um, talking about like the four temperaments in terms of like ancient medicine. Uh, but then that, that transferred to like the four personalities, the four archetypes, which are, which you find in any piece of fiction. Anytime you have four main characters, there are these just, four. Just You've got a, the brains, the brawn, the fool, and the wild card. Just ask Andrew's new favorite um, right wing pundit, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> archetypes and hierarchies. Uh, um, but like, but like the turtles, like the four archetypes of the turtles can apply to literally like take any like the A team or Seinfeld or Always Sunny in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. like any group of four characters and they will most likely fit into one of those, they will into map, those four uh, map archetypes. map onto this. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I just find very fun. <laughs> um, I have nothing else to add about the Ninja Turtles, Matt. This was very good. And I'm, I'm jealous of everyone who got to have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as part of their childhood because I did not. However, I have three favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle knockoffs that I want to talk about. One, the Mighty Ducks um yes my ooh, other favorite yeah. yes that's a good one. that was really yep. good two mummies alive and hell three, yes mummies alive <laughs> and three swat cats i don't remember so oh, cats. You, you kind of had me and then you totally lost me. i remember mm-hmm. so, so i remember samurai pizza here. cats 
Samurai <laughs> Pizza Cat. I did, I did not like. I know that existed, but I didn't remember that. SWAT I watched Cats, the Radical Squadron. I do remember these guys. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, you do. I uh, I I found you guys the the listicle that you were looking for. I just linked ah. it in the show notes. But ah. um, I mean, Battletoads is a TMNT ripoff. Yeah. Um, Extreme Dinosaurs and Biker Mike Biker Mice from Mars. I remember two other those. favorites of mine. Um, the Mighty Ducks, of course. The best one in this list has to be Snailians, however, which um, <laughs> I've never heard of before this moment. Um, Man. Oh, I don't know. Cyborgs you... is pretty good. Cyborgs. Yeah, are, you, are you sure is also good. Wild West Cow Boys of Moo Mesa isn't the one you're going for? <laughs> I am. These I are am all sh- very good. These are yeah. all great. Uh, the there Ducks is, is just pole. to. To end us on the ripoffs, there is a really awesome 90s commercial of Vin Diesel, who voiced one of the Street Sharks, showing how cool the toys are and how you can fit the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles toys in the mouths of the Street Sharks Sharks. toys. (laughs) Vin Diesel actually being the biggest nerd alive is one of my favorite pieces of Hollywood lore. Right. Um, Yeah. Avid D&D player. Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel. Vincent Diesel. And what better place is there to end than that? So thanks for listening to Debate This. You can follow along with the arguments on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Debate This Cast or on our website at DebateThisCast.com. Hey, speaking of that website, if you go there, you might notice a new link on the top of the page. That new link says support the show. And if you click that link, you can buy our merch. Yeah. You can buy our merch. <laughs> we finally have merch. If you want to buy it, go to debatethiscast.com. Click the support the show link and then click the buy our merch button. I worked really hard figuring out how WordPress works so I can make that happen for you. Please buy our merch. Also, if you want to commission a flavor text, you can get all the information about that at patreon.com slash debate this cast. Until next time, I'm Matt Cole. Am I first? Am I first here? Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. I'm Kyle, immature radioactive samurai slugs, Harper. I'm Todd. I'm a swag man. Ski ba da ba bebop bop. Thomas. <laughs> and, and I'm Andrew, come shell or high water, Henderson. Uh, Ooh, that was a good one. And we're saying thanks for debating with us. And if you think we're wrong, well, you can come bring us a pizza behind the swing sets. Cowabunga, dudes! Radical. Radical. 90s catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs>